I want you to turn to John's gospel, the gospel of John. We're going to look at that 12th chapter as just three verses. Only going to read three verses. John starting at verse number one. I'm reading from the New International Version this morning. Chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. We want to continue this thought, Mission Possible, the Irresistible Christian, part two. You may be seated. Your assignment, should you take this task? We continue our discussions from last week concerning the irresistible Christian. We've had four prongs to this message. We serve an irresistible Christ who has given us an irresistible charge. And we want to become an irresistible church. But to do that, we need a conglomerate, the gathering of irresistible Christians. I started dealing with this irresistible Christian last week. If you missed last week's sermon, I think that's one sermon you want to hear before you go to heaven. Last week's sermon, I took the, an analogy of Dr. King's life, and I used him as an object lesson that we might see some of the traits of what it looks like to be a irresistible follower of Jesus. I used Dr. King because he and so many others made the ultimate sacrifice and gave his life that all men might be free. But today I want to look at a different kind of sacrifice, one that is also important in the life of the believer. Our story starts in this 12th chapter of the Gospel of John. We find a woman by the name of Mary hanging out with a man named Jesus. Now this man, Jesus, had raised her big brother Lazarus from the dead. One of the most amazing miracles in all of Scripture Lazarus had been dead for three days. Matter of fact, when he went to the tomb, they said, Jesus, there's no use. He, he stinketh, for his body has decomposed. And they tell me that Jesus went to the tomb and called out Lazarus. And when he called the name Lazarus, that something started moving in the graveyard. Amen. And uh, the, old, the old saints would say the reason he had to call Lazarus' name because if he had said, come forth, everybody would have got up. <laughs> That's how much power Jesus has in his words. And so he said, Lazarus, come forth. And so we see Mary here, his little sister, is so grateful that she wants to be a part of this story. Look at verse 3 of our text. It says, Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet 
and wiped his feet with her hair. That is an amazing moment. And wiped his feet with her hair. Amazingly, this is the second time in Scripture that we witness an unusual encounter between a woman, a perfume bottle, and a savior. The first of the two encounters takes place in Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel, chapter 7. This is at another man's house, a Pharisee named Simon. Now, when you look at this first encounter, you, some get them confused because the, the, the same thing happened, but it's two different events. Well, you had a woman, a perfume bottle, and Jesus. There's a lot to unpack in this Luke passage because Jesus is hanging out with some strange folk. There's a woman there in this first encounter in the, in the house by the name of Mary Magdalene. You all have heard of Mary Magdalene. Now, now there, there, there were so many Marys associated with Jesus that they had to, to put her hometown at the end of her name. It's like Mary of Magdala. She was from a little town called Madala, and so they said there's so many Marys. His mother's name was Mary. And for us to distinguish which Mary that he's talking about, they said, well, this is Mary Magdalene from a town called Madala. The amazing thing about this particular Mary is that she was once a prostitute. Ah, uh, but that's not all. The scripture tells us in Mark's gospel that this sister girl had been delivered not from one, not from two, but from seven demons. In other words, before she met Jesus, she was full of the devil. Uh, that's Mary Magdalene. But that's not all. This ex-prostitute is chilling out with Jesus and of all places, a Pharisee's house. Now, wait a minute. That's not all. Because the Pharisee used to be a leper. What a crowd. An ex-prostitute and an ex-leper and a used-to-be dead man. All hanging around Jesus. Anybody glad that Jesus would always show up in your storm? No matter what you used to do, what you used to be, Jesus would always show up in your situation. Hey, he healed and delivered them. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus shows his power here in this Luke's passage and in this John passage. Well, how does Mary Magdalene respond to her deliverance? She pulls out a bottle of expensive perfume, pours it on the feet of Jesus, and wipes it up with her hair. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says this about a woman's hair. It says a woman's hair is her glory. Literally, she took her glory and used it to glorify her Savior. She used her hair, her glory, to glorify her Savior. And then this phenomenal scene happens again. The second time, in a little town called Bethany at Lazarus' house. Another woman named Mary made the same sacrifice. The events in Luke chapter 7 and in John chapter 12, our text, are so similar that some scholars try to argue that it's the same event, but not so. Even though both of the women' names were Mary, but not so. Even though they both poured out expensive perfume on Jesus, but not so. I offer to you today that one of the characteristics of an irresistible Christian is that your sacrifice, your offering, will influence others to do the same for the kingdom. In the words of Pastor Dave Ferguson, the author of the book Hero Maker, he says an irresistible Christian, my word, ought to see their fruit on someone else's tree. Could it be that Mary of Bethany 
was either there or heard about Mary of Magdalene and what she did to Jesus. And she was so impressed with the anointing of Mary Magdalene that Mary of Bethany, here in John chapter 12, replicated what Mary Magdalene did in Luke chapter 7. I offer to you that no matter who you are, somebody is watching you. Somebody is learning from you. Somebody is going to replicate or duplicate how you handle things in the kingdom. She saw Mary Magdalene make this great sacrifice, and she too said, I want to bless the Lord with a sweet-smelling sacrifice. That's what an irresistible Christian does. He or she walks among people in such a way that others want to emulate you, that others want to praise God like you, that others want to handle situations like you do. That's what being an irresistible Christian is all about. Mary Bethany, Mary of Bethany, heard or saw Mary of Magdalene and decided she too will follow her lead. Somebody is watching you. And how you handle your life will determine whether or not they feel like they could duplicate or replicate what you do for the kingdom. I got a call this week I thought was a rather unusual call from a pastor who is suffering from a very rare illness in our city. And I got this call, I got this text message from him, and the things he said to me, I thought maybe I had the wrong number when I got the text. Because he was sharing how much he loved me and how much he admired this preacher. And, and I went to my wife. I said, so, I said, honey, listen to this. I said, you know, I didn't know I was that close to him. I didn't know that. I didn't know that I was impacting his life like that. And so I said that to say this, is that you never know who's watching you. And people, people, people have an affinity to you that you have no idea they have an affinity to. That's why it's so important that we stay prayed up. That we continue to grow spiritually in the things of God so that we won't disappoint people when they need something, they need a light to look at. They don't have to go far because there you are. And they can call on you for special prayer. And you don't even know they're watching you. Amazing. Mary of Bethany has learned from Mary Magdalene of how to replicate goodness on the Lord. An irresistible Christian will see his or her fruit on other people's trees. You look around and you say, ah, oh, I recognize that. Because somebody got those words from you. Somebody got that technique from you. And it also brings glory to the kingdom of God. What kind of fruit will your children have? Will they bear some of the fruit of your life on their trees? And will it be good fruit? Verse 3 says, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. I like that word, pure. There were no ingredients adding. It was pure nard, an expensive perfume. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The same thing happened here in Lazarus' house that happened at the Pharisee's house in Luke chapter 7. Right here in John chapter 12, Mary of Bethany duplicates the same thing. And so as I look at this text, I begin to see, and then we, we gave you all a little book when you, uh, earlier in the, in the day, I, I begin to see some, what I call some treasure principles 
in the text. Number one, why would Mary do such a thing? Because Mary understood treasure principle number one. God owns everything I have. God owns everything I have. Why do you say that, Pastor? Well, Psalms 24 and 1 says this. The earth is the Lord's. And the what? And the fullness thereof. And the whole world and they that dwell therein. Look at what Haggai chapter 2 and 8 says. It says this. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. You might have on a little gold. You might have a little silver at home. But God makes it clear that all of it belongs to him. Everything that you own belongs to God. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. But remember this. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It is he that has given you the ability to produce wealth. All this time, you thought it was your education. All this time, you thought it was your, your, your talent. But the scripture says that it is God who gives us the ability to have a paycheck, to accumulate wealth. Everything we have belongs to God. And an irresistible Christian walks around realizing that everything we have right now is temporary. Somebody look at somebody and say everything. Go to look at them and say everything. <laughs> My father would own the glory, but he left me his, 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 his gold ring because he, was, he, he couldn't take it with him. Everything. So don't, that's one principle. An irresistible Christian realizes that God owns everything. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and this expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet. Why? Because Mary knew that she had the greatest treasure in Jesus in front of her. And nothing equated to that treasure. No amount of money, no size home, no promotion, put it all together, and it does not measure up to the treasure you have in Jesus. Mary understood that. And so she didn't allow this expensive perfume to keep her from blessing her Savior because she, she valued the treasure of Christ more so than the treasure of material things. Here's treasure principle number two. You cannot hold on to what you are not willing to give up. You cannot hold on to what you are not willing to give up for the Lord. I have money in my pocket today because I give money. I have love in my life today because I give love. I have friends in my life today because I present myself as friendly. The scripture is very clear. We reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. So you cannot hold on to what you are not willing to give up. Because if you're not willing to give it up, that means that that thing is more important to you than your God. And an irresistible Christian walks around saying, God, whatever you want, whatever you need from me, I'm tired, but I'm going to make it to the 9 o'clock service. Amen? 
I'm going to do whatever it takes, Father, that I might give you what you want. I'm not going to hold that from you. The Bible says that you reap what you sow. Mary's gift was not given out of obligation, but as an act of love for Christ. Giving is not hard when we love the object of our gift. Giving is not hard when we love the object of our gift. I'm learning that so much. I mean, of course, we exhibited as we were raising our children. I mean, there was nothing hoping I wouldn't do to make sure our children were okay. And you're like that. There's nothing you won't do for your child. You do what it takes. And oh, Lord, grandchildren? That, that's another whole level, right? Why? why? Why do we give so much to our grandchildren? Why? Because they are the object of our love. And the only question I have for all of you sitting here today is how much do you really love God? Because your amount of gift determines how much you really love Christ. If we don't love the recipient of the gift, giving is extremely difficult. If we're not in love with Jesus, bringing him an offering is extremely difficult. We struggle every time it's time to write a check to the Lord's work. <laughs> because we don't really love him. Not as much as he loves you. Because he gave everything that he had that you and I might have a right back to the Father. Amen. The, the quintessential ingredient in stewardship is possessing a proper motive. That's the crux of what we do. Is having the proper motive. My motive Forgiven to someone is that somehow they might see Christ in me. That's my motive. My motive for being here today is that Christ may, may count me present because I love him because he first loved me. So remember, you cannot hold on to what? You are not willing to give up. I see that in this text. Mary gave up all she had there. Look at treasurer principle number three. Giving God what he wants does not always make sense in the natural. Giving God what he wants does not always make sense in the natural. You've heard me share these points before. Mary did not go into her chest and grab a cheap perfume that she got from hotperfume.com. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She didn't go to, to that. She didn't get Sierra's women's cologne spray by Revlon. Or Pleasures by Esther Lauder. She did not grab her brother's, her brother's old spice. The scripture said, uh-oh, got in trouble with somebody. The scripture said she grabbed an expensive bottle of perfume. Let me tell you how expensive this perfume, because he said it was pure nard. Somebody say pure. pure. Nothing but pure nard. It's like having pure gold. It, she, it, it was so expensive that the scholars say that that perfume today would be worth $20 million. That's how expensive that pure nard was. It was a whole pain of it. And that's why, that's why it doesn't make sense in the natural. That's why she got some complaints from the people in the house when she took and broke that bottle of expensive perfume 
and poured it on Jesus because it just doesn't make sense in the natural. It takes a supernatural perspective to give God what he wants. You got to operate in the supernatural to make him a priority in your life. It was so expensive that the Bible said back then it took a whole year's wages to buy it. Whatever you make, think about it. Giving it all up for one bottle of pure, nard, expensive perfume. And then to take it and pour it, not waste it, but pour it on Jesus. It didn't make sense in the natural. Why would you do? Why would you, according to, to, to the human mind, the finite mind, why would you do something that doesn't make sense? Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. It says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. This is verse 4. John chapter 12. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? For it was worth a year's wages. Why would you do that, Mary? We could have used that to feed the poor. Go to the next verse. Look what Jesus said. Leave her alone. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should have this perfume for this day of my burial. Look at what that says. The reason that she has this blessing is that she might use that blessing for this day down the telescope of time. Could it be that you got that promotion for something that God wants you to do today? Could it be that God gave you that house today because he wants to do something through you today? Can you read it with me again? Leave her alone. It was intended that she have this blessing and that she save this perfume for the day of my burial. You would always have the poor among you. Verse 8. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Can I, can, I, can I rephrase that for us? We won't always live on this earth. We must work while it's day, for night cometh when no man can work. And so while... And Jesus said, no, no, wait a minute, you, you're going to always have the poor, but you're not going to always have me. And the reason she was blessed with this is that she might use it for this very purpose. Wow. Giving God what he wants does not always make sense in the natural John Piper says, I love this quote, the best way that I know how to capture the spirit of generosity is simply to say, the issue is not how much must I give. That's the question we ask. That's not really the question you ought to be asking. The question should be, how much dare I keep? How much of what God has blessed me with, because everything belongs to him, how much should I just use for me? And how much should I use for his work? How much time? How much time should I just use on me? And how much time should I give to the work of the Lord? Not how much should I keep. 
but how much do I dare keep that God might be glorified? Wow. Giving God what he wants does not always make sense in the natural. Here's the last thing I want to share. Mary understood that her greatest treasure was sitting next to her. And this brother Eddie is where I, I lost my, took my breath away. I start thinking about what would it be like sitting with Jesus in your living room? I, I, I was privileged. My family and I were able to go to Egypt. And I never forget it. We, were, we, we arrived there late at night. We stayed there. Uh, uh, near the Valley of the Kings, and we slept, woke up the next morning, and I go out on the balcony, and I almost stopped breathing because in the backyard of our hotel room were the pyramids. I literally, and I, I remember screaming, guys, come here. You know, Abraham saw those. Jesus saw those. I was looking on something that thousands and thousands of years ago people were able to see. It took my breath away. And many of you can think of experiences where you where you're just like it just it's so exciting. But but I thought Mary is sitting there next to Jesus. And I can't imagine what she's feeling in her heart. I mean, you all get excited if, if your favorite singer walks in the room. Screaming and hollering on top of your voice. But can you imagine sitting in the room with Jesus, you and him? It, it just takes my breath away. And so I think Mary said, you know what? I'm going to give him my best. So here, here it is. Here's principle number four. The heart of the giver determines the action of the giver. Where your heart is will determine your action. Now, if I walked out that balcony and I said, oh, yeah, that's just the pyramids. I've seen it a million times. But for me, that was one of the most extraordinary moments in my life. And so, your heart will determine your action, right? That, that's why Mary had no bars. She, she, she just did whatever it took to anoint Jesus. Forget about tomorrow. Matter of fact, if you look at verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, and the six days before the Passover, which meant she kind of understood what he was getting ready to do, and most likely he would not pass this way again. And while he's here, while I'm here, I'm going to give him the best that I've got. See, we, we think, yeah, this is second Sunday. We assume we're going to be here third Sunday. But I came by today to tell you, on my way to heaven, don't ever hold your praise because you never know if you're going to have another Sunday. So you got to, right now, while you're here, you've got to make sure that you're putting your hands together and giving God a praise because this could be the last time you come this way. Oh my gosh, she's sitting there with him and she's thinking, oh my Lord, he's right here in my living room. And he gave me back my big brother. I'm giving him the best that I've got. I was told that Butterball 
as a hotline and answers questions about their meat. A few years ago, one of the workers received a call early in November and the customer wanted to know if her turkey that had been in the freezer for 15 years was still edible. <laughs> so the, the gentleman for the butterball company said, hold on, ma'am, I got to go check this out with my supervisor. So he came back to the phone. He said, well, ma'am, let me tell you this. Your turkey is edible, but the taste is very diminished. And the lady on the other side of the other end of the phone call said, I, that's what I thought. Okay, very good. I'll just donate it to my church. Now, is that giving God the best you got? Why do we do God like that? If it's not good enough for you, why is it good enough for God? Amen? Give God something of value. Give him something of value. Give people something of value. I've seen some of you. I've, I've watched you, some of you. Yeah, I've watched you on your way in. And somebody say, I love that tie. I've seen you guys take it off and say, huh? That is so wonderful because you know that's one of your favorite ties. That's the kind of attitude God wants us to have. It's giving him, right? Because the heart of the giver determines the action of the giver. Can't you hear Mary talking to herself? Oh, my God. I'm sitting here with the rabbi. Now, I know we've, he's visited many times, but, but there's something special about him. There's something on him. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and, and, and he's talking death. He's talking like he won't be here much longer. And so her act of love and worship was public. It was spontaneous. It was sacrificial. It was lavish, and it was personal. Can I give you those adjectives again? It was public. It was spontaneous. It was sacrificial. It was lavish, and it was personal. Mary had sat with Jesus on many occasions, but there was something about him this time. She knew that this might be her last time. And she said, I'm going to give him my best now. I'm going to give him extravagant love. Not ordinary. No, extravagant love. I'm going to give him the best that I got. Too many of us like the fellow who called his girlfriend the other day and said, darling, I love you. I would climb the highest mountain for you. I would swim the deepest river for you, girl. I would fight a jungle full of lions for you. And if it doesn't rain tonight, I'll be over. Is that how we treat God? We got all this talk but no walk. For the heart of the giver will determine the action of the giver. Mary demonstrated an extravagant love. God does not deserve your ordinary offering. God deserves your sacrificial offering. David said it this way, I will not give God something that does not cost me. I may have to give God a little bit of my, my groceries this, this week because I want to make sure I bless the Lord. And so I'm, I may have to drink, may have to cut back a little bit this week, but I'm not going to leave without giving God an offering because God deserves a sacrificial offering. God does not deserve your ordinary worship. God deserves an awesome worship. 
God expects you to come to the worship center and to give him your heart. Give him your mind. Don't be afraid to wave your hand. Don't be afraid to say hallelujah. He needs your awesome worship. And he needs an extraordinary praise. He wants you to praise him. He wants you to articulate how much you love him. She gave her best. Scripture says that the fragrance was so wonderful till it filled the room. Other people ought to feed off of your worship. Other people ought to feed off your praise. Other people ought to feed off of the things you bring to the temple for God. It was an act of worship. And when worship is, feel, is, is real, it fills the whole sanctuary. It extends beyond these four walls. When worship is real, when you come to church and the pastor says something that impacts you, it spills over into Sunday night. It spills over into where you go on Mondays and Tuesdays. It just spills over because worship overflows into all areas of your life. Because the heart of the giver will determine your action today. When she untied her hair, something Jewish women were not supposed to do, she untied her hair, humbled herself, got on her knees, and laid her glory at his feet. She said, I don't care what others think. Criticize me if you will. But he's worthy of my glory. See, the devil will always try to keep us from going that next level with God. When you look at that text a little closer, Judas Iscariot wasn't concerned about the poor. He was upset that that money did not go into the treasure so he could take some of it. See, the devil's always trying to discourage us from going to the next level. And sometimes he'll get in those that we love that will keep us from going to the level God has called us to go to. But she said, he's my Jehovah Yahweh, my everlasting God. I'm going to give him my best. He's my Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer. Look at my brother sitting here. I'm going to give him my best. He is my Jehovah Shalom. He brings peace into my life. He is Jehovah Nissi, my protector. That's who he is. And that's why we must give him our very best. He gave us his best, and we need to give him our best. That's what an irresistible Christian does. He understands and she understands that these principles are so, so critical for us to follow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today's message. Thank you for the reminder that everything we have belongs to you. That everything that we use today is temporary. And that while we are in relationship with you, our stewardship must be personal, real, and God-honoring. You want us to give you our best. And no matter what season of life we're in right now, you want our best. 
God, thank you for giving us your best. And because you gave us your best, we have a home not made by man. We have a, a second treasure. Yes, we have a treasure in your son, Jesus, our Savior, but, but we have a second treasure, and that is heaven awaits each and every one of us that have accepted your son. We stand ready to give you our best. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand right now and let's see if there's anyone that may want to come forward.